is about a very interesting and intriguing case which will going to cover a lot of aspects of bone physiology renal physiology acidosis alkalosis and this is going to be a very challenging case both in terms of diagnosis and assessment normally when you talk about diagnosis it's usually more of a mathematical model which we talk about in uh, pediatric endocrine practice but often we have to go beyond that because there may be conflicting uh, reports which may come and then the diagnosis may be confusing and you can go and have a look at our website where all the presentations are available in that regards and you can go and have a look at our courses which are available including the fellowship and the diploma courses and this is part of our pg grand round we also run a pg lecture series every month and a grand round for endocrinologist every month our publications are there and applications are there uh, we had this 8 year old male child who was uh, uh, born out of a non consanguineous marriage and he was fourth by his birth order came with a complaints of difficulty in walking and uh, when we asked the uh, probe the further history we found that he had this complaint uh, which was running for the past 2 uh, to 3 years and uh, initially uh, along with the difficulty walking he also had a bony deformity which predominantly involved the lower limbs and uh, there was an issue of bone prank and for the same uh, complaint the patient had been running to several doctors and uh, on uh, and he has been on uh, on a consistent orthopedician for the past 2 years for and uh, he was treated with multiple <coughs> doses of vitamin d just given both in the form of uh, injection as well as oral treatment and also along with calcium supplement and for the same he was also uh, given some form of orthopedic in intervention in the form of cast and following the treatment for a very long time after 1 to 2 years they they found a mild improvement which was so in the form of the patient was able to started start walking but it was not as uh, no, like normal compared to the other sibling he was not able to run as uh, run or walk as uh, normally as compared to the other people other uh, children and uh, however in the pre, in the last 4 months before he met with a when he was climbing down the stairs he actually uh, fell down two steps above the ground and following which he had a very severe fracture involving the both upper uh, involving the both the lower limbs and for which the cast was applied and despite all these treatment he was able he priorly he was at least able to walk now despite uh, after all these treatment for the past 3 months now he is able to not walk as well as he is not able to even stand without support So now you have this case uh, who has a three-year-old child, very early onset lower limb deformities, and looks like a fracture. Yes. So now based upon these three things, very early onset lower limb, we don't know. We haven't examined, so we don't know what is the other way. So there is a definitely looks like a rickets yes, with sir. fracture. So yes, very sir. early onset rickets with fractures. What are the things you will? Sir, he is actually eight years old, and it started at around five years of age. Five years, two yes, three years. Sir, uh, two three years, years before and uh, eight years. So, what would you think of it in that regards? Sir, I would uh, probably uh, think of the fact that uh, it could be a uh, a CKD because there's uh, uh, rickets, refractory rickets. Definitely, it is a case of refractory rickets along with pathological fractures. So, one possibility involving the mainly the lower limbs, I would actually think of hypophosphatic rickets as a possibility, a chronic kidney disease. or a uh, renal tubular acidosis so how common so now you have to look at one is of course a refractory rickets yes sir in refractory rickets we know chronic kidney disease number 1 hypophosphatemic rickets rta number 2 proximal mm. rta number 3 and bdda number 4 but as soon as you start talking about fractures with the hierarchy change yes sir in case if it is a fracture definitely uh, the possibility of hypophosphatic rickets coming will be lower down the order at this stage having a fracture with hypophosphatic rickets will be extremely unusual so it will basically be excluded second if we talk about chronic kidney disease how often do you see ckd patients coming with fractures sir it is also a very rare case but the thing is that ckd is more common and it is also associated so with refractory rickets long standing severe ckd causing fractures may also cause many other things by that time the patient comes to you very severe anemia requiring blood transfusion pulmonary edema so that becomes less <laughs> likely from that perspective now one condition now with it now you got rta the major thing versus vddr what about vddr so vddr usually very rarely presents with rickets and bony deformity more often it usually presents with symptoms of hypocalcemia Which is often encountered during the infantile period and within the early. It can present with bony deformity, but then the onset will be very early. You can't wait till five, seven years to present that. So now, if I talk about five causes 
of non ergodermic uh, refractory lipids uh, in that sense now the most likely possibility is renal tubular yes. now which of these presents more with fractures sir more in case if it is refracted it is distal rte so at this is a classical presentation if you ask me an 8 to 10 year old child who will present with a relatively early onset feature but now has a fracture so distal rte will be more likely there the bone is very much affected Now, Dr. Manoj, when we come to their own involvement in distal and proximal RTE, what is the difference in pathophysiology? Sir, in the prox in proximal RTE, uh, there is a bone involvement due to the uh, loss of the minerals. Mm -hmm. While in distal RTE, bone involvement due to the part of metabolic acidosis. So, if we talk about uh, briquettes or metabolic bone disease, we say phosphorus deficiency is the Fundamental cause of all these bone deformities because phosphorus causes the apoptosis of the chondrocyte. So you need to have phosphorus deficiency. In proximal artery, the phosphorus deficiency is much more because you are losing phosphorus a lot. You of course have secondary hyperparathyroidism in distal artery, which will cause phosphorus deficiency. But here the phosphorus deficiency is very less. What about calcium deficiency? So calcium deficiency occurs in both. So you will have hypercalcemia. You will lose. But you can't lose a very huge amount of calcium because when you say four milligram per kg is the limit for hypercalcium, so four milligram per kg in a fifteen year kg child will be like sixty milligrams. So it is not going to be the primary cause, but it's a contributing cause. The big difference is that there the phosphorus is very low, the acidosis is much more in distal RTA. So distal RTA is purely a acidotic effect on the bone. Proximal RTA is largely a effect of phosphorus deficiency. Plus, then why is it more severe than hypophosphatemic briquettes? Sir, so because of the fact that uh, it is the acidosis is more severe enough, and uh, so you have some acidosis. You have secondary hyperparathyroidism. You don't have hyperparathyroidism in a hypophosphatemic briquettes. So that's why if you now hierarchically arranged hypophosphatemic briquettes will be very very milder disease. Compared to proximal RTA, and then finally distal RTA will be the most significant. So, if I now go back to this history of a mid middle childhood onset with looks like lower limb with fractures, the most likely possibility will be RTA distal followed by proximal. This is based upon the finding that we found in California. And with regards to the other history, there was a history of a poor gain in height and weight since the onset of deformities. And uh, there was a history of polydipsia. However, this is not very severe. When we probed the history, they told that he was actually drinking more amount of water when compared to other children at home. And there was no polyuria, recurrent episodes of fever or uh, paralysis. And uh, there was no history of abdominal pain or hematuria, ruling out the possibility of nephrocalcinosis. There was no decreased urine output, headache, uh, breathlessness to rule out CKD with hypertension complications. No problems recurring any dental interventions to rule out the possibility of hypophosphatic rickets. And there was no tetanic convulsions or carpopedal symptoms uh, to rule out the possibility of VDDR. And uh, no abdominal distension, chronic diarrhea, or steatorrhea to rule out the possibility of malabsorption syndrome, most commonly being the celiac disease. And there was no night blindness, photophobia, and bleeding gums. To rule out other micronutrient deficiency, also to rule out the possibility of a uh, low syndrome, dense syndrome, where there is loss of a uh, low molecular weight uh, <coughs> protein, which cause a loss of retinal uh, binding protein, leading to vitamin deficiency and transient night blindness. And there was no jaundice, hematomasis, or melina pruritus to rule out the possibility of cholestatic. Uh, Jaundice and also chronic liver disease, and uh, there was no history of abnormal movements or any decline in studies to rule out the possibility of Wilson disease. Let's go. You said there are no features of chronic liver disease. Now, how common is refractory rickets in liver disease? Sir, it is very rare unless it is associated with malabsorption or tyrosinemia. Why? Uh, it's because uh, liver has a very large capacity of uh, vitamin D storage, so it has to be around ninety percent of uh, liver, which is twenty-five hydroxylase enzyme. Much more than it is needed in the body. So unless the liver goes off completely, when the patient will have hepatic encephalopathy, you will not develop rickets in that scenario. So as you very nicely said, that if you have rickets in liver disease, most likely think of proximal RTA, which is also damaging the liver, rather than liver being a primary pathology. Now you mentioned a very important point that there is no polyuria or paralysis. So which which form of RTA would this now point? Sir, no. Who has more polyuria? 
proximal so proximal has more polyuria okay and uh, so why, why do they have polyuria so proximal because of there, there is a loss of potassium hypokalemia which can cause polyuria okay. apart more hypokalemia Sir, uh, distal as, but uh, in case of proximal, there is excessive uh, uh, the fraction excretion of sodium is also very high. There is a loss of uh, sodium which is being uh, delivered to the distal. Okay. So now let's go one by one. So what you are trying to say is that proximal artery has got more polyuria yes, because of solute solute loss. loss. Using uh, phosphorus, you're using sodium, you're using other other things. But the major cause of polyuria in artery, one of course is tubular dysfunction. Is also at the level of uh, a problem of ABP action, which is mainly because of hypokalemia. So that's why distal artery often may have more polyuria. What about paralysis? Who is more likely to have paralysis, distal or proximal? Because their potassium is much lower. So these are pointers, but you can't use them as a criteria to distinguish. But they are subtle signs. So at this level, you expect much severe hypokalemia. Which is, if it's not there, will go more in favor of a proximal artery. But these are subtle signs. Yeah. And with regards to the uh, past history, there was no any significant past history prior to these uh, lower limb deformities. There was no any significant hospital admission for dehydration. There was no history of any blood transfusion and no chronic drug intake. And with regards to the breast uh, birth history, there was no any antenatal uh, polyadrenomus. No, it, the, the baby was a normal child with a normal breath weight and there was no significant neonatal admission. And uh, with regard to the family history, there was no history of any similar illness of bony deformities within the family. And there was no history of any uh, dialysis or kidney transplant uh, done in the family members. And there was no history of any polyuria, recurrent stones or abnormal pain in mother. And so, with, uh, which drug history would you like to take? Sir, I would like to ask in case of a history of astrozolamide, uh, okay. And uh, antiretroviral drugs in case uh, the patient has been affected. So in other words, what are the causes of proximal? Which drugs cause proximal RTA? Sir, proximal RTA most commonly the uh, astrozolamide, tenofovir, uh, ifofosfamide, and. Uh, Which common anti epileptic drug causes? Sir, valproate can. Topiram. So you need to specifically ask that because others are very specific. If you're talking about like phosphamide, they will be using very specific yes. scenarios. But topiramate is something you need to ask about. Ethylazolamide also, in very rare scenario of raised ICT, will you have to use in that time. So drug intake becomes important. Which toxins will cause that? Exposure to which toxins? So toxins, lead, lithium. So heavy metal, mercury, lead, so they will cause the damage in that question. So you need to ask about that question. They'll carry for it. And with regards to the development history, the child was studying in class two, which was actually age appropriate at the two years before. But because of the COVID and also the uh, bony deformities, he was not sent to school for the last two years. And he had uh, all these milestones, which was uh, achieved appropriate for the age. And there was no regression of previously attained milestones. And with regards to the diet history, uh, it was appropriate for age and there was no calorie or protein deficit for noted. And now we have the summary of an eight year old male child who was born out of an non consignment marriage, not gaining in height and weight since two years. And he had bony deformities, which was partially improving with vitamin D treatment, which is most likely to be refractory catch. And he also had a fracture following a trivial trauma and which was basically pathological. So, so what is your impression now at this moment? Sir, as you already mentioned, the first thing would be a RTA, most likely to be a distal RTA followed by proximal RTA. And next uh, thing would be uh, Kidney, think of, of a uh, minor, a tubular predominant kidney disease. Yes. Because if it's a glomerular kidney disease, usually they will have many more other manifestations. So some like obstructive neuropathy, like the child who comes to us who had now has got a glomerular function disease. So they will take time. They, they will typically present at this age with similar pictures. They will behave like RTA. And uh, when we, we've uh, based on the history, we got the examination done and uh, we found that most of these uh, examination findings are positive with relevant to the history. We had the features of uh, rickets in the form of widening of race, rachidic rosy, protrubent abdomen. There was severe tenderness and pain on movement of the lower limb and there was no alopecia to rule out vitamin D dependent rickets. No cataract which was ruled out to variative disorders including galactosemia and uh, uh, low syndrome. So genetic other than the normal ones, but which are the syndromic causes? Other 
So syndromic usually their autoimmune conditions are most commonly associated with distal RDA, which basically involves the uh, systemic lobe erythematosus and Jogren syndrome. Yeah. And there was no dental abnormalities uh, in the form of enamel hypoplasia, which is commonly seen in uh, hypocalcemic rickets and also dental abscess to rule the possibility of hypophosphatic rickets. There was no pallor ectress and clubbing to rule out uh, malabsorption as well as uh, chronic liver disease. No cafelate spot to rule out the possibility of mechanal bed syndrome. No hepatospinomegaly uh, and also there was no hemangioma. And uh, this was the child who, as we could clearly see from the picture, the patient had clear features of uh, rickets along with uh, severe failure to thrive. When we got the uh, vitals then, which was uh, normal, and there was no acidotic breathing. And uh, his uh, height was uh, severely deranged with a minus 3.40 standard deviation and weight also was severely deranged. Now, if you look at the growth parameters, what do they tell you? So it looks to be a more of a nutritional pattern. But both are equally affected. So it excludes hypophosphatic rickets basically. Basically, right? sir. Because it is too low. Yes, sir. Can anything else now you will start thinking of something else as well, given the growth parameters? Sir, very rarely celiac disease being more common, but with this kind of presentation with celiac disease, right, uh, so lab, but still we have to. Definitely, if it was rickets alone, fractures are very unlikely. So pure vitamin deficiency should not cause rickets. So, Dr. Pratik, what are the pointers of refractory rickets right at diagnosis? One, of course, is the treatment has been given, the patient has not responded. What are the other pointers you look at? If this rickets is not normal, fracture. Fracture is number one. Severe group failure to fight is number two. Polyuria, polydipsia, these things do not go straight. Yeah, so I'm not talking about this. Yes. I'm talking about what are the pointers yes, of the refractory rickets right at diagnosis. Fracture is a very big pointer. What is the uh, causes of neonatal fractures? What is strong? Yes, that is there. Oh, yeah. it's, uh... Metabolic bond is it's like your premature child that the second common third, why was in the picked up, then hypophosphatasia. So all those things. So, fractures and BDDR. BDDR is always a differential diagnosis than a neonatal. But at this age group, if you talk about fractures other than trauma, uh, like I have seen patients who have been labeled quote unquote as osteoarthritis imperfecta, who have been then labeled as root anatomy art. So, you need to be aware about that this level of height retardation will go against OI and other normality. So, again, I summarize the case. Uh with uh, after the examination findings we had this eight year old male joint born out on non-consignous marriage with a uh, severe failure to thrive refractory catch and pathological fractures what's the hearing normal sir so this would be the uh, probable dds i would like to rule out so and uh, first investigation which was uh, basically done and which was actually present along with the patient which showed a severe uh, generalized osteopenia along with classical features of rickets Heel fractures and uh, probably loser zone. So, are yeah, these so the this is a very, very characteristic x ray. What you see is that the bone is absolutely the cortex is very, very thin, just like a pencil thin cortex, you can say. So, it means there is a severe osteopenia, the bone is not being formed at all. We talk about how at different stages the chondrocyte is not being formed, then we talk about bone not being formed, bone not being mineralized. So, bone is formed, but it is not mineralized. mineralized. So, this is actually. Similar to what you see in hypophosphatasia, something like that. Hypophosphatasia, it is not getting deposited. Here you don't have any phosphorus, that's why it's not getting deposited. You are uh, seeing features of rickets, but often with nutritional rickets, you will see much worse features in the metaphysical. So the whole bone here is, it's not just that the, it's a disorder affecting just the metaphysical, the epiphysis, that area. It is affecting the entire bone. When you see nutritional rickets, you will see much more cupping, fraying, which is not very much visible here. What is uh, what you are seeing are uh, fractures. Uh, we are not seeing, but loser zone are there. What are loser zone? Sir, that is often and the line that you are seeing, like the white line, yes, the lucent line. These are the loser. Some area are like this, and these are the loser zone, which are the features of there. And there are heel fractures. So this is suggesting that it's not just a Disease uh, this is localized to the growth plate. It is a generalized bone effect. And what it looks like is more of a 
uh, a generalized demineralization in that perspective. So this is what we need to then start considering in that regards. Do we have features of hyperparathyroid bone disease? The no, sir. X-ray you could have magnified. Do we have any features of uh, periosteal resorption? Not much of features. Not. So what it means is that it is, if you look at this X-ray, it is predominantly a problem of the mineral. If there is a problem predominantly of uh, vitamin D, you will have just the distal involvement much more. The bones will not be there. If you have problem, problem of hyperparathyroidism, pseudo hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism, you will have patchy areas from which the bone is taken out and you will have some resorption and risk will happen in that regard. If you have acidosis, now acidosis can also impair mineralization. Again, similar picture, but if you have complete deficiency, then also you can have a similar picture. So we also got the investigation, basic calcium, phosphorus and ALP profile was done, which showed a low normal level of calcium with significantly low phosphorus. And this, uh, the previous reports was even more severe with the phosphorus level of 1.06 milligram per deciliter. And the alkyl phosphorus levels were very high, which is suggesting that the bone is uh, working so much to produce uh, the minerals and uh, to rule out the phosphorus. So if you look at these reports, calcium low, phosphorus low, ALP high sign differential here. So one is uh, so one is the proximal RK. Second will be hypophosphatemic crickets that may occur. I was saying that hypophosphatemic crickets is excluded. So by the level of phosphorus it is excluded. No. By the level of calcium. It is excluded because it is calcium. So hypophosphatemic crickets cannot happen in this sort of that's what I'm trying to say. Other calcioplatic every form you can have. So how often will you have hypocalcemia and hypothetical? This is borderline sweat. Okay, so but even borderline should not happen in that regard. So hypocalcemia excludes hypophosphatemic crickets. That is one. So this then you can think of VDD or milder form, you can say theoretically, you can say malabsorption also. This picture will happen. You can say this picture can happen in RTA, which is very, very characteristic of this picture. Now, Naveen, based upon your this report, is it more likely to be a proximal or a distal RTA? If I think it's RTA. Sir, it is more likely to be a proximal because of the, it is very much clear that the alkaline phosphate is very extremely elevated, which is seen more because of hypophosphatemia occurring in proximal rather than the acidosis causing uh, uh, bony deformities. That's what Manoj had mentioned that in distal RTA, the problem is because of acidosis and decreased bone formation or bone illusion. If you put a bone in the acid, it is being taken off. So there, there is no increased turnover if the formation is less. So ALP is usually normal. It is not low. But if your ALP is high and you're thinking of RTA, this is a strong suggestion that this will be proximal than this. So this is a subtle sign. What about calcium between proximal and distal? Sir, uh... It is almost covering both. So there will be calcium oh, loss. You, in have mild you will not have very severe hypocalcemia, but mild, which is good enough to cause hyperparathyroidism. See, ideally, I would expect both of them to have some hyperparathyroidism, which will further contribute to the bony deformity. Now, you said phosphorus level of 1. Because what does it uh, favor? Proximal or distal? Proximal. Because proximal, you are mainly losing phosphorus. So, if you have a phosphorus of 2.5, both of them can have that. But if you have a documented 1, 1 1.5, it is more likely to be a distal arc. Okay, carry forward. And to rule out the other possibility, which you already mentioned, is the uh, chronic liver disease with SGPT was in the normal range and uh, malabsorption of uh, celiac disease was ruled out. And uh, <coughs> to rule out the possibility of uh, uh, vitamin E deficiency, which is extremely rare because he has taken tons and tons of injections, which was found to be on the normal range. And we got the venous blood gas analysis done, which was suggestive of a uh, mild acidosis with bicarbonate at the level of 16 with a base excess of minus 9.1 and uh, it was a case of a normal anionic gap metabolic acidosis. So now in this case you haven't done a TMP GFR. How do you know that the phosphorus has been lost in urine primarily? The sir, phosphorus is low. How yes, do you know it is the urinary loss of phosphorus? Because of the fact that there's a uh, normal anionic gap metabolic acidosis, based upon those three, you haven't got a TMP GFR done yes, or a TRP done. 
So do you think you are justified to say that the phosphorus is lost because of urine? Because dietary phosphorus deficiency is extreme rare, which is not. Anybody who phosphorus is low has to be because of renal phosphorus insufficiency. If you look at the formula of the MPGFR, it starts by plasma phosphate minus the ratio. So anybody who plasma phosphate is low, this MPGFR has to be. So what I'm trying to say is that it is a very tedious investigation, and it is not going to make a huge difference in terms of the evaluation and management. So low phosphorus. Chronic hypophosphatemia is equivalent to renal loss of phosphorus. You will not have chronic hypophosphatemia without high PPH. This is very clear. As I said, chronic hyponatremia is because of high AV. AVP. Chronic hypokalemia is because of high uh, aldosterone. aldosterone. Same, if you have chronic hypophosphatemia, it is because of high PPH or a primary tubular in which you are losing. So that is very, very clear. Don't worry in that regard. So now this picture in a refractory rated scenario, mild hypocalcemia, low phosphorus and a high ALP goes more in favor of a proximal RTA if you have chronic kidney disease and severe disease, the other two differentials. Now we'll go on to the acidosis. So how do you interpret this blood gas? So because bicarbonate is on the lower side with the base axis, which is more than minus 5 suggestive of mild to moderate um, metabolic acidosis with normal anion gas. So could this be because of secondary hyperparathyroidism, uh, uh, Pratik? If we say there is vitamin D deficiency, now you have corrected and because of that, we had hyperparathyroidism which caused fentanyl like picture and you had mild metabolic acidosis, phosphorus. So, but if you in the case, do you think no, this case? Because there are fractures. Theoretically, you had presented a case like this who had recent onset vitamin deficiency, secondary hyperparathyroidism, and mild metabolic acidosis. So, this is a similar picture. Here also, you don't have very huge metabolic acidosis, but you uh, clearly can't cause fracture. So, which means that there is this metabolic acidosis is also not causing fracture. This is part of the illness. The main problem is somewhere else. That somewhere else looks like possible. Because if acidosis was the main problem, ALP should be low or normal. And phosphorus, anyway, it doesn't make a difference. So now this is a mild acidosis. So now do you think this is proximal or distant? Sir, now it is almost conclusive that it is more likely to go in favor of proximal because of the fact that the acidosis is self-limiting in proximal. So in this case, it is mild. Uh, apart from that, there is severe hypophosphatemia with raised levels of ALP. All this more, uh, so more going towards very, it. very clearly a child who had a very early onset, relatively early onset of bone deformity with fractures, very high ALP importantly, very low phosphorus which is documented, and mild metabolic acidosis. I think there is not much doubt that this is proximal RTA. So your aim should be that by the time you reach to more complicated investigations, your diagnosis is made. Let's go forward for you. And we also got the PTH done, which was normal. So this also rules rule out the possibility of distal RTA with secondary hyperparathyroidism causing this kind of picture. And the sodium and potassium are then potassium was found to be on the low normal side. And we have this patient with high, uh, acidosis with hypophosphatemia and all the previous investigation, which clearly suggested of uh, proximal RTA. But when we got the, these investigation done, it added slightly, it gave us a more confusing picture with the urine pH uh, falling above 5.5, which is uh, 6.4. And the rest of the, which was suggestive of a proximal tubular dysfunction in the form of glycosuria of 2 plus, albinuria was present which was 1 plus, and there was hypercalciuria, which is suggested by high urinary spot calcium creatinine ratio. And the sonography KB was done to rule out nephrocalcinosis and it was not there. So what does high urinary calcium creatinine ratio suggest, Manoj? Proximal versus distal. You have hypercalciuria. Mm -hmm. So more likely for proximal or distal? Hypercalciuria can occur in both. And despite the hypercalciuria, there is no nephrocalcinosis. What does it mean? Proximal. It is something like uh, when you say Reducing substance positive, but it is non glucose reducing substance. Then you say it is glycosine. So, hypercalciuria can happen in both proximal and distal RTA. But despite hypercalciuria, an eight year old child not having a nephrocalcinosis or even a stone 
it is extremely unlikely to be a dyslexia. So this was in favor of a toxicology. What saves these patients from developing nephropathy? So they have citrate urea and alkaline. Uh, in that sense, they don't have a problem. All know that renal acid-base regulation involves the excretion of proton. Everyday body produces one to two millimoles per kg of proton, which is excreted, and then it is reabsorbed and then secreted, basically. While bicarb is filtered at a huge amount, that's like seventy millimoles per liter. So if somebody is losing bicarb, competing that will be much more difficult as compared to have treating somebody who is just having a problem in acid excretion. In other words. distal rta will have much more severe acidosis we'll talk about that later but treating distal rta will be easier as compared to treating proximal rta because whatever bicarb you give is going to be lost in the urine that's a primary mechanism now 99% is absorbed only 1% is lost in that regards so as discussed most of the bicarb is actually reabsorbed at the level of the proximal tubule along the soda bicarbonate sodium bicarbonate and carbonic anhydrase enzyme along with that you have absorption of phosphorus amino acids and glucose so if you have a generalized proximal tubular dysfunction you will have amino acid urea phosphate urea glucose urea which will be a very easy clue so always look at the urine routine often we order that and we don't see it here it was there the treating physician doctor who had already discussed and found there was a glucose urea that could be a very very strong pointer that there is something wrong in that perspective now out of this then the bicarb is basically 10% resorbed at the distal tubule now within this perspective we are talking about rta it can be because of two things either you are not able to excrete the acid or you are not able to absorb the bicarb so the problem could be proximal rta in which you have a major problem out here so in this scenario once your bicarbonate level goes below 15 the amount of bicarb filtered will be less so then you will be able to acidify your urine and that is why it's a self limiting disease typical bicarb levels in proximal rta are 12 to 20 in my experience usually it's around 16 15 16 something like that is the usual fill once the blood becomes acidic the urine also becomes acidic so this is very very important if your ph is less than 7.2 your urinary ph as a normal response should be less than 5.3 rarely 5.5 is also used as a cutoff so if you have a urinary ph above 5.3 or 5.5 with a significant acidosis that is that is distal rta or what else what other condition cause acidosis and a high urinary ph acidosis and high urinary ph one is the cell rta second so if you have a uti because of a urease producing infection your urinary ph may be falsely high second Yes. So, if you have hypovolemia, you again will have alkalosis. So, so, whenever you are doing a urinary pH, two things you have to do: urine routine microscopy and a urinary sodium. RM should be normal, and urinary sodium should be more than twenty-five. That would basically mean that you are fine in that perspective. You don't have a dehydration in that regards. Now, this brings us to a big question: Can we have a high urinary pH in proximal artery? High means more than five point three, five point five. So, it is possible if the blood pH is not, if the blood is not acidic. So that is the most important thing. So, as we say in diabetes insipidus, that your serum sodium should be more than one forty five before you start thinking and looking at what your urinary osmolality is. You your urinary osmolality may be low if your serum sodium is one thirty eight. But the question is whether the urinary osmolality remains low when the sodium becomes above one forty six. same here you may have mild acidosis your ph is more than 7.2 bicarb is not that low the body doesn't want to be acidic so that is why you will not have a acidic urine so just because you have one or two urinary phs which are more than 6 6.37 you can't exclude the scenario of proximal rta in that scenario that's a big message which still comes out of this case again 
of course there will be no calcification because you are losing calcium but you are not having any lack of citrate citrate prevents you what causes hypercalciuria in uh, rta let's say in general uh, one is increased sodium increased sodium Yes. So what you're trying to say is that your sodium delivery is more in the distal tubule and in exchange to that, you have loss of potassium, your loss of proton, your loss of calcium, all those things is there. So that is one mechanism, but that's not a primary mechanism. Why? Because in distal RTA, you have some dehydration. So your sodium delivery may not be very high. When you treat then your sodium delivery will go up. So what is the other mechanism? What will happen if you have acidosis, if you have hypokalemia, what will happen? Uh, there is a polyurea. So potassium will basically be low. So body will like to uh, is, uh, so save potassium. No, no. Body will like to save the potassium. If you are saving potassium, then other ions have to go out. Because sodium is exchanged with proton, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So if you are having a systemic hypokalemia or a systemic acidosis, in that case, of course, you will have hypercalciuria also. Intracellular acidosis also causes hypercalciuria. That is the basic mechanism. So it's a response to acidosis. It's not a problem of distal tubule in that perspective. Now, distal RTA is a severe problem. The problem here is that uh, you are not able to excrete protons. If you can't excrete protons, they will keep on accumulating. So that's why it's more severe. You will have alkaline urine and there will be calcification. This is simple dichotomous variation, but as said, exceptions and confusion will happen in that regards. We'll not talk about type 4 RTA, which is more of an aldosterone problem in that regard than hyperkalemic form. So RTA could be distal because of genetic defects, acquired defects, alkaline urine, severe form, may be isolated with calcification. One very common association of distal RTA is deafness. So whenever you have a child with rickets, always ask about deafness as an important parameter. Proximal, which can be genetic or part of acquired drugs, and it is acidic urine self-limiting in that perspective. There will be no calcification. And then finally, we have hyperkalemic, which is rare and mild in that perspective. So if we talk about proximal RTA, and we discussed this in much more detail in our last discussion about how the kidneys actually have bicarbonate resorption in the proximal tubule. So you can go into our last grand round on uh, RTA. You will find this in much more detail. It essentially involves three major players. You have got this sodium proton exchanger, proton ATPase, sodium potassium ATPase, and this sodium bicarbonate channel. So the defects can be at the proton ATPase channel, which causes transient proximal RTA, sodium bicarbonate transporter, which causes recessive form, sodium proton exchanger, which causes dominant form. So there are various channelopathies which can cause this, or if you have a diffuse dysfunction, you will have a Fanconi syndrome. Now, we have discussed in much detail showing that there is an electrochemical gradient between the blood circulation and the lumen. So, which is negative and which is positive? This electrochemical gradient is responsible for what? Sir, it is, uh, it is responsible for positive ion absorption. So, that positive ion will include calcium, magnesium and other things. Now, because of this problem, if that gradient is disrupted, all your calcium loss will also happen in that regard. So that becomes important from that perspective. So now we've discussed about what is proximal, what is distal RTA. Now Naveen will talk further about how do we talk about more causes of RTA. And uh, we have this case of a uh, Fanconi syndrome and with regards to the cause, it can be a case of uh... Isolated Fanconi syndrome, where there is only sole manifestation of proximal uh, renal tubular dysfunction, which could be either hereditary in the form of uh, Fanconi renal tubular syndrome 1, 2, 3, 4, where the uh, gene affected is the FRTS gene. And in most of the cases, it can be sporadic. 
And with regards to the other manifestations, which are generally seen in association with the proximal renal tubular acidosis, includes the cystinosis, dent disease, low syndrome, trisensima type 1, galactosemia, hereditary factors intolerance, Fanconi Bickel syndrome, Wilson disease, and mitochondrial body. Here we'll be discussing the three major diseases where the proximal renal tubular acidosis is the cardinal manifestation of the syndrome, and the other uh, features are also present. And we'll be laying out the uh, other syndromes where uh, one of the association of the syndrome is proximal renal tubular acidosis. And um, the three which are actually mentioned includes the cystinosis, den disease, and the low syndrome. The other disease where the proximal renal tubulosis is very common is the vancani bickel syndrome, which is associated with hepatomegaly and uh, proximal renal tubular uh, dysfunction. But it usually presents at a very younger age, uh, which is around uh, less than in the infantile group. So we will be dealing with the uh, three diseases in detail. So, what are the so with regards to cystinosis, it is basically autosomal recessive disease, which is characterized by mutation in the CTNS gene. CTNS gene is responsible for the production of a protein called the cystinosin. Cystinosis is basically a transporter, which actually uh, extrudes uh, cystine amino acid from the lysosomes. In case of this defective protein synthesis, uh, this cystine starts accumula accumulating within the lysosomes and uh, causes destruction of the cells. So this is more commonly distributed in the proximal renal tubules and also in the eye. And apart from that, it is also seen in multiple systems and the core manifestations are the proximal renal tubular acidosis with a uh, ocular manifestation. And uh, there are basically three different types or the groups of uh, cystinosis. The first one is the most severe form, which is the infantile form, where there is development of uh, proximal renal tubular acidosis occurring within the first month of life, and uh, which is followed by ocular manifestation in the form of uh, cystine crystals getting deposited in the cornea, leading to various forms of keratopathy and other, uh, other various ocular manifestations. And the next most important uh, organ or uh, the system which is commonly affected with respect to cystinosis is the endocrine system, which is characterized by uh, insulin requiring diabetes uh, mellitus. And there is uh, features of hypogonadism, delayed puberty, azospermia, and there is growth hormone deficiency, which are seen associated with cystinosis. And multi-organ, many organs are actually involved with respect to cystinosis. And the prognosis is very grave because the many of the uh, children if uh, unrecognized, usually land up in CKD within the first decade of life. So it is very important to consider uh, cystinosis as a possible diagnosis when you are seeing a patient with a proximal renal disorder in the infantile group because uh, of the management option which is available with cystinosis. And the next uh, form which is extremely rare, which is seen in about 5% of the cases of cystinosis is a juvenile form, which is basically a slow progressive form of the cystinosis where the Patients are usually often diagnosed in the uh, after the uh, first decade of life, most commonly in the adult age with uh, end stage renal disease. And uh, this, uh, if you could uh, actually correlate with the case, this probably can be a case of juvenile form of uh, cystinosis where we actually diagnose it at a pretty early period with the proximal renal tubular dysfunction. And uh, the which and there is one more form which is the rare form where there is only ocular manifestation in the absence of renal manifestations. So most important which part which I mentioned is the recognition of disease because of the fact that treatment is available, which is available in the form of cysteamine bitartrate, which is known to uh, slow the progression of disease. And uh, it has shown to improve growth, delay the progression of end stage renal failure, but it has not shown to cause improvement in the sy symptoms of proximal renal tubular function and also ocular manifestations. But uh, when, when this uh, cysteamine is given the form of ocular drops, then it has shown to uh, uh, decrease the uh, cysteine crystals which are being so formed in the clinical pointers of cystinosis? So clinical pointers is basically the proximal renal tubular dysfunction along with the uh, night blind theory. Photophobia is more common, sir. Photophobia and is the manifest. So we need to do a slit lamp examination to look for the crystals. Sir. And uh, and with uh, and with regards to proximal renal tubulosis, it is basically the supportive therapy which I'll be discussing in the next few slides. And uh, in case if the uh, end-stage renal disease has manifested, then we need to go in for renal transplantation. And the next most important, but it doesn't uh, correlate with the case is is the low syndrome, which is caused which is excellent uh, recessive form of 
disease uh, characterized by mutation in the OCRL1 gene, which basically represents the ocular cerebral renal syndrome, which has manifestation in the eye, characterized by the presence of dense congenital bilateral cataract. These cataracts can be even seen on a prenatal USG, which can be diagnosed prior to the birth of the child. And it is usually present at birth in the form of bilateral cataracts. And they also have other manifestation in the form of glaucoma with blue plasma, usually develop in the first decade, first year of life. And in some patients, it can develop as late as around second to third decade. And there is also features of corneal scarring and keloids without any history of trauma, which usually occurs after five years of life. And the next most important system to be involved is the nervous system, which is characterized by severe muscle hypotonia. Uh, which is usually seen during the infancy period with severe form of intellectual disability and behavior abnormalities in the form of uh, temper tantrum, aggressive behavior. And uh, with respect to the renal manifestation, it is characterized by uh, proximal renal tubular dysfunction, the form of low molecular weight proteinuria, amino aciduria, lysosomal enzymeuria, uh, acidosis, phosphaturia, hypercalcinuria, hypercalcium and nephrocalcinosis. And the most important thing is that uh, there is absence of glycosuria. It is extremely very rare with respect to the low syndrome. And uh, the patient usually develop uh, end stage uh, renal disease requiring renal transplantation and dialysis in the third and fourth, between third and fourth decade of life. And the other manifestations uh, are the osteopenia, tenso, tenoitis, arthropathy, growth failure, dental manifestations, platelet dysfunction in the form of uh, uh, delay in platelet addition and uh, epidermal cyst. And with regards to the another common disease which we need to identify in the case of uh, proximal renal tuber dysfunction is the dense disease. And this is the, uh, basically X-linked recessive disease which is uh, characterized by the mutation in the CCRL5 gene. And uh, it is diagnosed on the basis of the criteria, three criteria, which is the low molecular weight proteinuria, along with hypercalciuria and any one of the following, which could be nephrocalcinosis, nephrolithiasis, hematuria, hypophosphatemia, and renal insufficiency. So this actually goes uh, very close to our diagnosis because we already have two features and being a pr proximal renal tubular acidosis, we definitely are going to have a low molecular weight proteinuria. But the one thing which is actually going against is the glycosuria, which is actually very uh, rare in this case, but when I saw a few number of case series and one which was basically published uh, from Ames New Lady, they also had around 10 to 20 patients of uh, patients with dense disease had glycosuria. And, but various case studies show that the glycosuria is often very rare with respect to dense disease. And one more thing, it is most commonly seen in boys. And this also being a boy child with filling the almost all the three criteria, this was one of the strong possibility to be considered in this patient. One factor here probably is that because of renal calcification not being there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, when you have a female carriers, because this is being an excellent, this is a uh, female carriers, you usually have hypercalcuria, low molecular weight, proteinuria, and uh, in very rare situation, they may have nephrocalcinosis. And there are like one in 100 patients progressing to CKD. And this was one of the questions which I asked for the history of uh, polyuria and uh, nephrocalcinosis in mother. And with regards to the management, it is basically increasing the uh, uh, fluid intake along with the low sodium diet. And uh, in case there is nephrocalcinosis is commonly associated with this condition, we can start uh, thinking of giving diuretic, but we have to keep a control on the serum potassium level. In case if there is hypokalemia, then we can think of adding amyloride. And uh, we also have to be very cautious uh, in using vitamin D because of the fact that there's already hypercalcuria. In giving vitamin D, there's can this can lead to the development of nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. So we have to be quite cautious uh, when we are giving vitamin D therapy and it has to be indicated only in case of a bone disease or else it is better to avoid vitamin D therapy in this case. And in case of uh, hypophosphatemia, which is also one of the rare manifestations, which is also seen in one third of the patients with dent disease, we need to supplement with phosphorus. And there's another type, which is basically dense disease too. And this is actually a continuum of the low syndrome. Low syndrome it, and density fall into a mutation of the involving the same gene, which is the OCRL gene. But it has all the features of dense disease along with mild features of the low syndrome, which is basically characterized by mild intellectual disability, hypotonia, subclinical cataract, and nephrosin calcinosis seen around 40% of the patient. And uh, we have, when we get a mutation, with regards to the OCR gene, we have to consider whether it is low or whether it is, is a dense disease type 2. This is basically based on the 
uh, severe out of the extra renal manifestation. In case if it is mild, it, then it is a case of dense disease type 2. In case if it is severe, then it is a case of low syndrome. Now, in this case, one should be making a type of proximal active. What further workup would you suggest? Sir, further workup, I, I would like to have a eye examination to look for the presence of any cataract or any uh, coronary system crystals. Then I would like to go in, sir, in case it was better to go in for a genetic analysis so that uh, we actually... You can look at the ordinary micro and the plus minus. Yes, sir, but yeah. since it is fan cone, already there is glycosuria, so definitely... The eye, eye examination, liver examination, these will be very, very, very important good. from that. And then genetic testing probably just to confirm the long-term. Yeah. Outcome. Because treatment may be variable in certain conditions. Do we suspect RTA? We all have discussed this. If you have a growth failure, which is nutritional pattern growth failure, rickets with low phosphorus, renal calcification, periodic paralysis, polyuria, acidotic breathing, these are features of RTA. Now, when we diagnose RTA, you need to have three things. You need to have renal tubular acidosis. So you need to have a pH, which has to be low, less than 7.2 ideally. Base excess has to be negative, less than minus 5. And it has to be tubular in the sense that anion gap is normal. So high anion gap situations are ruled out. Normal glomerular function and ammonium excretion is also something which we look at using urinary anion gap. So hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis with a positive urinary anion gap is equal to renal tubular acidosis. We all know about anion gap. It is the difference between the unmeasured negative ion and the unmeasured positive ion. In other words, it is the difference between measured positive ion subtracted by the measured negative ion. So it's sodium minus chloride minus bicarb. It is usually 10 to 12. If you have accumulation of organic acids, you will have a high anion gap situation. While if you have loss of bicarb or increase in HCl like GI loss <coughs> or a RTA, you will have a normal anion gap scenario. So we are talking about a normal anion gap situation. Urinary anion gap is a similar thing. It is basically the difference of urinary sodium and potassium, which are the measured positive ion from chloride. If your urinary anion gap is positive, it means ammonium production is defective. It is more like a RTA. If urinary anion gap is negative, it suggests a increased ammonium production, a normal ammonium production and suggests a GI loss, which of course, in somebody who is 80 years old with fractures, you will not think GI loss as a primary cause here. But anyway, to evaluate, diarrhea causes increased ammonium production and you will have a negative anion gap. And RTA, your impaired ammonium production, you will have a positive urinary anion gap in that scenario. Now, this is important and we are mainly discussing what urinary pH in this case. So, as anybody who has metabolic acidosis should have a acidic urine that is less than 5.3. If you have a pH more than 5.3, you think of distal RTA, but there are other caveats which we discussed earlier. Infection because of urease producing bacteria which cause high ammonia, which may cause alkaline urine. Dehydration will also cause a impaired acidification in that scenario. So basically, you need to have a urinary sodium, which is normal, and you need to have a normal urine routine microscopy before you do a urinary pH. Now, this is one test which we can do later on to confirm. This is fraction excretion of bicarb. Urinary pH is done when you have acidosis. Fraction excretion of bicarb is done when your bicarb is around 20. So once you reach that level, you can then do that. Either do a bicarb loading or even with oral, the levels go up and then you can do the test. This is basically only to look at whether your bicarb excretion is more or not. So if you do bicarb of 16, you are pretty much having a compromised one because it's already going to be less because it's not being filtered. So measures are urine and blood bicarbonate and urine and blood creatinine. The standard formula is urine bicarb upon plasma and upon uh, urinary creatinine into plasma creatinine upon plasma bicarb into 100 as we do for fraction excretion of sodium, potassium. Same thing. If the level is more than, usually it's 15 to 20% in proximal RTA and less than 3%, 2% in distal RTA. So it's a good test, but should only be done when your serum bicarb is more than 20. The problem is how will you get serum bicarb of 20 in proximal RTA? Because as soon as you start doing that, you will lose bicarb. 
So I would say even if your bicarb is 18 and your FE bicarb is high, then it is basically a proximal artery. You don't, don't need to wait till 20. The only issue is that at 18, if your FE bicarb is low, you cannot exclude proximal artery. To exclude proximal artery, this cutoff of 20 is there. Urine to blood CO2 difference provides the evidence about how much your urine is acidifying. Requisite, again, you need to be doing this in metabolic acidosis. You look at urine and blood CO2. And in that scenario, if it's low, it is distal. If it is high or normal, it is proximal. Now, how do you measure urine CO2? Sam? How do you collect the urine sample for a blood gas measurement? So if you collect simply and it gets exposed to the air, your oxygen will be more, carbon dioxide will be less. So what you can do? You can put a oil and on that collect. So oil becomes up and then you put a either a capillary or a syringe and then you try to pull it off. So urine sample should be taken with a drop of oil when you're collecting that. That will give you a more reliable finding in that scenario. So now if we summarize, you have a bicarb which is on the high normal side, 12 to 20, not very low. Your potassium is low. Urinary pH is less than 5.3. And urinary calcium is normal to high. It is usually proximal RTA. Distal RTA, the bicarb would be much lower. Hypokalemia will be much more profound. Urinary pH would be more than 5.3. And hypercalciuria will also be more. But hypercalciuria, again, is not a discriminatory test. Fe bicarb will be much lower in distal RTA. So the most important test here, I would say, is urinary pH and Fe bicarb. Urinary pH during acidosis, Fe bicarb during correction of acidosis. Anion gap is high. You have to look at other causes like uh, blood sugar, lactic acidosis. If anion gap is normal, look at urinary anion gap. If urinary anion gap is negative, it is GI loss. If it's positive, look at potassium. If potassium is high, it is hyperkalemic RTA. If potassium is, on the other hand, normal or low, you then differentiate between distal versus proximal using urinary pH, Fe bicarbonate, and urine to blood carbon dioxide difference in that scenario. So if your urinary pH is generally less than 5.3, it is proximal, while if it's more than 5.3, it is distal. Now, in this case, the urinary pH was 6.8. 6.4, which goes against proximal RTA. So why are we thinking that? Because the acidosis was not very severe. And you may have variable urinary pH in proximal RTA. So just one reading cannot exclude. On the other hand, if you have a urinary pH which is less than 5.3, does it exclude distal RTA? Naveen, you are able to acidify, you can't have distal RTA. So which basically means that the main role of urine pH is to exclude distal RTA. A urinary pH less than 5.3 excludes distal RTA. A urinary pH more than 5.3 suggests distal RTA, but is not confirmatory. This may happen with UTI. This may happen with dehydration. This may happen with a milder situation of acidosis and a proximal RTA. So that is something too important to distinguish. So I think you will just summarize here. I'll be summarizing the oral case. Now, with regards to the proximal RTA, uh, what are the points that are suggested? And there was a generalized proximal renal tubule dysfunction in the form of glycosuria and hypophosphatemia. And there was mild to moderate acidosis because of the fact that uh, proximal RTA is generally self-limiting and uh, refractory catch and generalized osteopenia uh, for the degree of acidosis, which suggested the uh, catch was more due to phosphate loss and uh, it was not not mostly due to acidosis. The point which was basically against was the urine pH of uh, more than 5.5. And one more thing I would like to add on this is the alkaline phosphate levels, which was very high, which was suggested more of a proximal RTA than distal RTA. And points which were for is the pH more than 5.5 and the presence of hypercalcia. And uh, which was basically against the distal RTA is because of the severe osteopenia and regrets, which was not correlating with the degree of acidosis and the high levels of ALP, and there was no nephrocalcinosis despite the hypercalcuria and uh, presence of generalized proximal tube dysfunction. So this was already being summarized over the entire class, was that uh, urinary pH in proximal RTA can be variable, and it is basically dependent on the, on the degree of acidosis and also the amount of filtered bicarbonate. With fractures, with mild acidosis, high ALP, with a low calcium, 
it is nearly equal to proximal RTA. Don't really get confused with urinary pH. It may be slightly high and it may be variable in that regards. Now, other big issue which comes out from this is that once you diagnose proximal RTA, that's not the end of the story. We just saw this case two, three days ago, so we don't have the further workup, but we have to exclude cystinosis. That is very, very important. And as Naveen was saying, Dent syndrome. So we need to do more workup in that regards. Similarly, if you diagnose distal RTA, you have to go for uh, uh, in younger children, genetic causes, older children, more like an autoimmune workup has to be done. So how do you treat proximal RTA? If you give bicarbonate, basically, you will have a greater loss of sodium and bicarbonate in the urine, and that will result in greater potassium loss. So while hypokalemia is not very significant in the setting of proximal RTA at diagnosis, it worsens with treatment. In distal RTA, your potassium will be worse, but it improves with treatment. In proximal RTA, the hypokalemia will worsen with treatment, which is important and that you need to be aware of. So that's why what you do, you can basically give potassium or you can give the combination of thiazide amyloride, which may help out in that scenario. The bicarbonate dose is much higher, 10 to 15 millimoles per kg per day. We'll discuss what you did in this case. And you can use thiazide amyloride to reduce the bicarbonate requirement. Potassium has to be given in the initial phase and phosphorus 50 milligram per kg per day which is to be given in that scenario. The risk is of hypokalemia. Vitamin D may also be required and usually it improves over time in that regards. Now you have to monitor for the blood gas, the bicarbonate, the target is 22 to 24, but you will never be able to achieve 22 to 24. It is something like hypophosphatemic rickets. When you give phosphorus, your PTH goes up and your phosphorus is lost. So there is a vicious cycle. Here your bicarb becomes high, the body filters it out. So basically, you're never going to achieve the perfect target in that scenario and three monthly follow-up will be required. Growth will improve. Bone, you will require phosphorus and vitamin D. Polyuria will improve, but hypokalemia may worsen. So that's why you have to be cautious in that scenario. So Naveen will talk a few words about treatments which are specific in what we did in this case. So let's discuss on how we manage this case. And uh, with regards to the phosphorus, uh, since the phosphorus was very low and also it was responsible for such devastating consequence in the form of refractory case as well as pathological fractures, we started uh, with a phosphorus supplement, which is basically available as at first sachet and with one sachet contains around 500 milligram of uh, element of phosphorus. And we started a dose of 40 milligram per kg per day. And uh, <clears throat> since the acidosis were not very severe and the bicar levels were around 16, and and because of the increased risk of hypokalemia on initiation of uh, treatment, we started uh, bicarbonate as a very lower dose at 2 millicolon uh, per kg per day, in the form of a Nordosis Nord tablet, which is available as a 500 milligram tablet containing around 6 millicolons of uh, bicarb. And uh, in children, giving a lot of tablets would be, uh, would be a big issue because they were generally find it difficult to take a lot of tablets. In such cases, we can actually go in for syrup Nordosis, where around 1000 milligram is uh, present in 15 ml, 15 ml, and we can actually give it like a juice or something, uh, where we can give a large amount of uh, Nordosis syrup. And that is the more, uh, that is things which we are actually thinking when the bicarbonate rates, which might increase uh, over the period of time in case of proximal RTA. And uh, since the patient was having a severe form of rickets, uh, we started a vitamin D and calcium su supplementation for the treatment point of view of rickets. And uh, since the potassium was also on the low normal side, we started potassium, which is available in the form of uh, hot force. Uh, at 2 milligrams per kg per day. And one more thing is that it is uh, citrate is also available and it also gives 1 milli equivalent of bicarbonate. So uh, that there would be advantage of uh, giving citrate because it will prevent the formation of a, uh, nephrocalcinosis and also it will prevent additional amount of bicarbonate which is present in the syrup. And 1 ml contains 2 milli equivalent of potassium. And on follow-up, we are actually planning to do all the, all the following things. And we are get, planning to get the calcium phosphorus in ELT level and reduction in ELT level is a suggestive of bone healing. And uh, the next important thing is to get the potassium level and also the venous blood gas level done because uh, there's a high, high chance of uh, hypokalemia on initiation of uh, bicarbonate. 
and we need to titrate the dose of both potassium and bicarbonate based on our venous blood gas as well as the potassium levels. And the most important thing is that because we have started on uh, vitamin D and calcium supplementation in way of rickets, in case if it is uh, hypercalciuria along with nephrocalcinosis form as seen in dense disease, there's high risk of developing nephrocalcinosis. We have to be cautious with uh, that and we need to get the OGK AUB on a uh, regular basis uh, for the likelihood of uh, for seeing the prob problem of uh, nephrocalcinosis. And uh, we are planning to do this X-ray after three months because uh, refractory rates in such cases usually takes a very long period for healing. So to look for healing, we are planning and to also look for the uh, <clears throat> improvement and also the osteopenia, we are planning to do the X-ray and also of the lower limb to see the improvement. And the one thing which helps us to make life things easier regarding the uh, etiology. So we are actually planning to get a next generation signaling to identify the cause and also explain prognosis to the patient. You can all go and have a look at our website, join our webinars and our publications and application. We'll see about these specific questions and issues which are there. Uh, I think there is one question, no polyuria in this case. So there was no polyuria here. As I said, polyuria is because of two things. One is because of loss. The major is hypokalemia. Now, hypokalemia was not very significant, Dr. Kamlesh, in this case. So that's why we didn't have uh, much problems in that. Mm -hmm.